All right, in this tutorial, I'm going to show you my techniques for shooting the moon. I plan on rambling on, so right here at the beginning, I'm going to show you the important parts of this video, which is going to be the equipment that I use and the settings that I use on my camera. Then after that, we'll get into some examples on the computer. I'll also give you a rundown on some software that you can use to find out uh, uh, locations and where, what date, and what time that you might want to be in a certain location to shoot the moon. We'll get to that a little bit later on. So right now, let's start off with the equipment I use. Well, you see a lot here on the table. I don't use all of it all at the same time, but I'm bringing it some here for examples. The first thing we want to have is a good, strong, heavy tripod. Now, what people don't realize is the moon is moving pretty quick. And when you've got some big, heavy cameras and lenses on there, it doesn't take much to get camera shake. Even a little bit of wind coming will shake the camera as well as people just walking next to your tripod. So the heavier the tripod you can have, the better. Now this one is kind of medium. Uh, it's, it's a good compromise. It's good and heavy and sturdy, but I can carry it for a little bit of distance if I had to. Now if you don't have a heavy one like this, you can go ahead and use like a travel tripod like I have here. Uh, one thing you can do to make it more stable is don't extend the small part of the leg. Keep it, keep them locked down, and then just use the upper part. Now, what that means is you're going to have to get down a little bit lower. That is a little bit of a pain whenever you don't have a flip-out screen, but uh, it's a compromise that will make your uh, picture sharper. Okay, so now we've got the tripod. Now we've got to talk about the tripod heads. Uh, to me, this is probably a standard head. Most people have this type. Uh, this is a ball head. There's really nothing wrong with it. It'll work just fine in all the photography we have that we're going to talk about today. But it's not the best choice uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the biggest, of course, is that uh, we're going to have to recompose. You're not going to carry all this gear for however distance you want to to set up to shoot the moon to take one shot. You're going to want to take multiple shots. Well, especially when you have uh, some long focal lengths, you're going to have to recompose on almost ever, every shot. Well, what I found with these, and this is a good one, this is a good heavy one, but if I take an, uh, if I am adjusting, I'll loosen it up, I'm adjusting it, I'm getting the moon just where I want it, I like everything down real tight, I let go of it, it sags. It may or may not be where I want it to be on the moon. I might have to estimate, go up a little bit higher and lock it down so when it sags, it'll fall down on the moon. Well, that's a pain if you're taking 20 or more images. So, there's some alternatives. Like I say, this one will work if this is all you have, but there's alternatives. Uh, the first alternative, and this is really a good one, this is a video head. And what's good about this is these adjustments are oil dampered. So they move very, very slow. And then when you lock them down, they're good and tight. They very seldom sag very much. This is a good alternative to have. It's pretty heavy, but still, this will give you sharper images. Uh, if you're rich, like I am, or you're just a nut that buys camera gear all the time, I bought this tripod head strictly for the moon. Now, it's a geared head, which means that once everything is locked down, the weight is on this already. So when I make these very fine, minute adjustments in elevation or left and right, uh, I'm right on. There is no camera sag whatsoever with this gear head. Uh, whether you want to put that kind of money out just to shoot the moon, that's up to you. But this is also good for landscape photography or even portrait as far as that goes. But anyway, so that's my choice. Uh, so we've, we've got the tripod, we've got the heads. Now when it comes to the camera, there's not too much to say about the type of camera as long as it can shoot in manual and it does, you are able to change the f-stop, the ISO, and the shutter speed. Uh, when it comes to low light, you're not going to have to worry about noise because the moon is bright. So some of your cheaper cameras will work just fine. You just want to be able to make those manual adjustments. Uh, 
we'll get to the settings on the camera next, but right now we're just talking about the equipment. Well, the next thing, of course, is the lens that, that you're going to use on your camera. Now, on this one, it's a landscape lens. It's fairly light compared to my 400 millimeter focal length. Um, this one can be used on one of these other tripod heads without too much problem at all. Uh, but we'll, we'll save the uh, settings for later. Uh, now I want to talk about the lenses. Now I use two types of lenses. I have three types of images that I take uh, on the moon. The, the first image is just a landscape image. This, uh, this F4 uh, um, 24 to 105 works just fine. Uh, but the other two need a big lens, a long focal length, at least 300 millimeters or above. This happens to be a 400, fairly heavy. Um, that type of an image is when you have a moon rising and you want to have a foreground object in the front. Uh, usually it's a silhouette, but nonetheless, you're still getting a foreground object as well as the moon itself. So you're going to want to have a long focal length for that. And then the final type of image, of course, is just strictly the moon, nothing else around it. That's the one where you really want to bring out the detail and the shadow and the craters. Uh, you're going to need the big 400 millimeter focal length lenses for that, at least 300 or above. Finally, there is the cable release. These things are dirt cheap. If you don't have one, it's worth getting one. You can go to Amazon, eBay, whatever. You can get them for 18, 19 bucks. They do a wonderful job. You just might have to get one that will fit your particular camera. Now, why this is important, you could use the timers on your camera. This camera has a two second and a 10 second timer. I could use those, but they're not optimal. For instance, if I have a DSLR, now this is a mirrorless, but if I had a DSLR, I would want to use what's called mirror lockup, and we'll get into that when we come to settings. And that would take two clicks of your shutter to get to take a picture. The first click raises up the mirror out of the way, and you want to watch, you're going to be in live view. Uh, you're going to watch and make sure the camera stops shaking, and whenever it does, you can hit the second cable release and uh, shutter release and you'll have a nice sharp image. Uh, even with the mirrorless camera, this comes in handy because uh, if, say for instance, you set a 10 second timer on the mirrorless just to be sure everything settles down and you press the shutter uh, on the camera and then you're waiting the 10 seconds to tick and here comes a gust of wind or somebody walks close to your tripod. Those things can cause the camera to shake and then you're going to waste an image. But with this, even with the mirrorless, you're looking at the uh, back of the camera and the viewfinder and whenever you see the camera has quit moving, it's really locked down. It could be five seconds, it could be 10 seconds, it could be even longer, but you can hit this cable release and uh, you'll get your sharpest image. Okay, so that's it for the equipment. Uh, here in a, I'm going to set up my camera and uh, then we'll show you how the settings I use for the individual images. Okay, here we are trying to set up the settings for our camera. This is a Canon camera. This is my uh, settings menu. It's going to be different of yours, of course, but the things we're going to talk about are going to be the same through almost all cameras. Well, th the first of the three images that I usually take is a landscape image. And in this image, the foreground is what's really important. I want to make sure that I have the foreground exposed correctly. So I'll take a few test images and I will get the foreground exposed like I want it so I know what the settings are. I'm going to keep the ISO at 100 and I'm going to keep the f-stop at f11. I'll just, it will automatically feed in the shutter speed until I get the right exposure. Now, once I have that, then I'm going to bracket. And But first off, before we get into bracketing, let's make sure that all our other settings are the correct ones. So first off, let's go down here and we have it at 100, we have it at F11, we have it in AV mode. Now we want to go down here and check our white balance. You could use auto white balance, it would probably work properly, but I usually like to use sunlight whenever I'm taking these kind of images. Whatever you use, you're going to take multiple shots of the moon, of the foreground. You're going to take more than one. So you want everything to be consistent. So just pick one that you like. That's really all you have to do. 
Then let's see, anything else? Yeah, we'll go down here to the number of shots. Since we're going to bracket, I am going to set this to high speed. Now, all that will do is that whenever I do, take, when I am set up for bracketing and I hit the shutter, it's going to take all the images as quickly as possible. Okay, so now uh, we want to set up bracketing since we have all these controls set properly. So I go up here to my menu and here is my exposure compensation and auto exposure bracketing. So I'll click on it. Now, I'll go over here and you'll find the controls on yours. They're all different, but on mine, I can just take and determine how many stops that I want on either side of the proper exposure. So here I'm doing one stop and then two stops. So I'm going two stops below and two stops above. Now, when I'm taking this type of image at night, I know the odds are that the moon is going to be blown out. So rather than have the proper exposure in the middle, I'm going to turn it down one stop. So now what this means is I'll have three images below normal and only one above. And that will work just fine. So we'll go ahead and click OK. And now whenever we're ready to take the image, we just let her go and then we check and make sure that one of these five images or however many, uh, I have the camera set up for five, some people have it set up for three, others have it set up for nine. That's all up to you as to how many shots you want to have. But what I did forget to mention is before I do any bracketing at all, I usually take and put my hand in front of the lens, take an image, do my bracketing, set up, do the bracketing, then put my hand in front and take another image. And that way, the bracketed shots will be surrounded by two dark images, so I don't get confused, and I know where they are. So that's how I use the landscape. Now, the second type of image that I usually take is a moon that's ra rising off of the horizon. Now, I actually use the same settings that I use for the landscape and do the bracketing. Uh, especially if I want some of the foreground in this image to show up, to, to have detail. If all I want is silhouette, then I can just concentrate on the moon and forget about the foreground and go into the next set of settings that I'm going to show you. Now, again, ISO 100, F11, AV, which is your f-stop priority, and high speed for bracketing, and off you go. Now, the third type of image is the moon alone. Nothing else is around it, and this is the one where you need manual mode. So what I'm going to do is go up here and click and set for manual mode. Now when I have that entered, I'm going to go ahead and set the ISO at 100 like I did on the other two, F11 because I want to get some detail, and then I'm going to set the shutter speed here. Now this is where you want to know before you get out in the middle of the dark. You want to know what control on your camera controls what. See this one controls f-stop, that's not the one I want. This one over here controls my shutter speed. Well I'm going to set that arbitrarily at 1 125th of a second. Now. Again, the uh, auto white, the balance is set to daylight. Uh, I'm not going to bracket here, so I am going to take and turn this bracketing off and take it back to one shot. And now I'm all set. Now, what I usually do here before I take any images is I go ahead and do my focusing. Now, I, I'm doing this in my living room, so I don't have a moon to focus on. But all you do is make sure that your lens is in autofocus mode. Go ahead and set up your composition to where you get the edge of the moon, where you get the single point. Single point autofocus is what you want to use here. Not multiple, not groups. Single point autofocus. Whenever you do, put that point right on the edge of the moon and the black of the sky or the, of space. That will give you the most contrast. That would allow the auto focusing system to do a good job. But even then, once I have that done, I reach up and I turn off auto focusing. And then I go ahead with my hand as I use the focus ring and I move slightly back and forth. 
just to make sure that I am absolutely set on the focus. Then I leave it alone. I've got the focus turned, the autofocus turned off. This way, when I press the shutter, it doesn't try and do any focusing. Believe me, the moon is not moving away or moving towards you, even though it's going left or right or up or down. It's not getting any far away. So the focus is going to stay exactly. Now, what I'll do then is when I get everything composed as I want, got the focusing down, which is important, I'll take a test shot. I'll just take a shot. Now, the odds are it will not be the shot you want. That one one twenty-fifth of a second won't be correct. It might be, but the odds are it won't be. Now, if it's the moon, say, is a little bit too dark, well, all you have to do is go up here to your shutter. Whoop, didn't mean to do that. Go up here to your shutter speed. And now we're going to let more light in. So we'll go over here to the left down to 1 1 60th, and that will let more light in. We'll take another test shot. Now, if it's still too dark, do not go below 1 60th of a second. The moon is moving too fast. If you've got a 300 plus lens on there, anything below 1 60th of a second is going to blur because the moon is moving that fast. Now, remember, the moon is very bright, so what I would do is use my ISO. I would take and hit the ISO, and I would bring the ISO up a third of a stop, two-third, or even a stop. See how it goes. Take another image and see how it goes. Now, once you get the correct exposure, you got the most contrast that you can get in the moon, you got everything set nice and tight, then you go ahead and take a series of images. Now you want to take at least 8 to 10, maybe even as many as 20 images. And we'll get, again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so we're, we're pretty well all set with that. But now, as another scenario, what if the moon is still too bright? Well, if the moon is too bright, that means you got to shut down the shutter. So if we had it at 1 one twenty-fifth. We want to make the shutter faster so less light comes in. So say we bring it up to 1 two hundredths. That's just a good starting point. Take another shot. Now, you don't have to worry about raising the ISO and getting noise. Almost every camera today can go up to 400 without any problem, and many of them go 800 or even 16, but you're not going to have to go anywhere near that whenever you do this. Uh, now, when it also, when it comes to exposure, if you want, now this is the arbitrary method where it's absolutely manual. If you want, you can take and set your, um, you can set, you take your metering. This is evaluative. Now, why evaluative metering doesn't work is it takes all the light in the image. Well, it's mostly black because of the night sky. The moon is, is just a very small part. So when it evaluates the proper exposure, it'll make everything too bright and that's what blows out the moon. So, if you want to you try and use evaluative metering instead of starting out in manual, go over here and turn it until you get to spot metering. Now, what spot metering will do is only where, it won't take the whole image, it will only take where the one spot is on the moon. And you put that on a bright part of the moon, and then press your shutter down halfway, and it could meter, and it may get your metering pretty close. Myself, I just don't like doing that. To me, it's just so much easier just to start off in manual mode, take a couple test shots, and we're all done. Okay, so that's about it for the settings. Now we'll head over to the computer, and we'll give you show you some examples of uh, what I'm talking about. Okay, now we're ready to get on the computer. I'm going to show you the three examples of the type of moon that I shoot and, and show you some reasons why I use the settings that I showed you before. So let's start up uh, Photoshop here. Now, this is the first kind of image that um, we will look at, and it is a landscape image. Now, as you can remember with our settings, we're F11, they were uh, ISO 100, 
and we were an aperture priority. And that's what I was whenever I took this image. Well, you can see how small the moon is in comparison to the rest of the image, and there's very little detail. Now, if I were to take and increase the detail in that moon, let me show you another example here. We'll go to this one here. Now you can see I have increased the detail in that moon and it just doesn't look quite right. It's just a little bit too much detail for the moon in that situation. I would have been much better to have just left that moon alone and, and let it be exactly as my eyes saw it. So uh, let's go now to the uh, moon rise. Now in this image you can see there's a little more detail in the moon because I'm using a longer lens. But you're not going to have a lot of detail in this situation because you're shooting through the maximum amount of atmosphere. And that's going to do a couple of things. One, it's going to make it the detail a little wavy. Otherwise, you're going to have certain areas that are a little sharper than others, just simply because of the amount of air in between and the movement. But that's OK. Uh, it, this was pretty well as I saw it. In this image now, I backed way up on the street from when I took the other shot, or at least this is the first shot I took. I backed up as far as I could in order to be able to use my long lens and make the moon look larger in relation to my foreground. Whereas in this image here, I was actually closer, much closer, and the moon is relatively small in, in, in relation to it. Uh, now, the settings on here, I used the same ones. I exposed far the uh, foreground, so I made sure I had the street and all the lights without blowing anything out. And then I took some bracketed shots and I picked the best moon in Photoshop, which might be another uh, tutorial later on. I brought in the two images, one with the moon properly exposed and the other with the foreground properly exposed. And I used a mask and I combined the two. But uh, you might be lucky. It depends on the type of evening. If this was in the golden hour or in the blue hour, you might very well be able to get the moon and the foreground exposed properly in one shot. Uh, but if not, then you're going to have to learn how to use layers and, and do some masking. Okay, so now the last type of an image. Uh, this is the moon. Now, this is the one where we started out in manual mode at the 1 1 25th of a second and f11. Uh, we took and zoomed in here on the uh, edge right here. We zoomed in on the edge to get our focus the best we could. Now, as you can see on a full moon, two things. One, this moon was at least 30 degrees up in the sky. And that means that I wasn't shooting through a lot of atmosphere. It was up in the sky. Uh, I could get everything set. I got some detail. You can see along the edges where the detail is. But on a full moon, you're not going to get a whole lot of detail because you don't have any shadow. The uh, light is reflecting almost straight back. So you may want to, and I do too, when I want to shoot the moon, I would much rather shoot this type of an image. Now look at the difference in the detail here where you can see all the shadows and the cratering and so on. Um, so again, this was taken with the same settings of uh, ISO 100, F11, and 1 1 25th of a second uh, that I adjusted. So here we have those, again, we'll go back over them, the three kinds. This is the landscape where the moon is relatively small. You don't want to get too much detail on the moon. It won't look right. Um, this was a daytime shot, so actually this was a single shot. I didn't have to do any combinations. The foreground and the moon managed, and I did bracket, and I got this particular image, and it was great. Uh, in this shot, of course, uh, if I exposed to far the, uh, the foreground here, well, it blew the moon out. It was just a white blob. So I did bracket, and I took the bracketed shot, and I did mask and use layers, and I replaced it. Um, again, here uh, uh, with the, uh, I, you have to back up to get your subject. You know, another nice subject would be if you could find a meadow with a nice, pretty tree, and you could back up uh, maybe half a mile as far as that goes. Get out your long lens, uh, zoom in. 
Uh, you're going to get a little bit more detail in the moon, but not as much as you'd like because you're shooting through all the atmosphere. Uh, but again, you might have to take multiple images and combine them so that you don't blow them out. If you want detail in the foreground, a lot of times all you want is the silhouette and then you can just expose for the moon and you don't have to worry about the foreground because it will just show up as a black silhouette and that's just fine. And then again, here's the moon, the full moon shot. This moon was taken greater than 30 degrees up in the air, so I didn't have a lot of to, uh, uh, atmosphere to go through. I had the same settings as um, before. I had the F-11, the ISO 100, and on manual mode, however, and I had the shutter speed set, at least to start, with 1 1 25th of a second. I might have adjusted it one side or another. I'm not sure. And then finally, here is my favorite kind of moon shot. And this is the one that has, uh, you know, where you, you get a lot of side light. So you're going to get shadow and, and the, um, uh, you're going to get a lot more detail. The craters are going to have shadow in them and they're going to show up. Okay, so that's it for these examples. Now I'm going to show you at least one program called Photo Pills. And this will allow us to pick a spot. Uh, set up your camera, well not set up, just pick a spot and see if the moon will ever rise where you want it to rise in that location and whatever elevation you have and I'll show you how to do that. Uh, there's also another freeware that you could experiment with and it's called Sequitur and what's good about it is say you take 20 shots of the moon, say it's the big moon like this and you have taken 20 shots because of the movement of the air, part of the, most of the moon is in perfect uh, sharpness, but a little bit isn't because of the atmosphere in between. Well, what Sequitur allows you to do is to enter in all 20 shots, and it will pick just the sharpest areas of each one and then combine them in the end. So uh, that might be a separate tutorial because it's a little bit different of a program. We'll get that in a minute. Okay, so now I'm going to shut this down. I'm going to start up photo pills on my iPad and show you how I set up a location for a moonshot. Okay, now here we are on the iPad and this allows me to use a program called photo pills. A photo pills is a wonderful program for photographers. It can do everything you can think of when it comes to photography. But we're only going to worry about how to use it to find a place where we can set up and have the moon in a particular position that we want. And it will tell us the time and the date that we need to be there. So we're going to start photo pills. Uh, hopefully you can see this the way I'm doing it. Right down here in the corner, it's this little yellow icon. It's photo pills, and we're going to give it a start. Now, as you can see, all this, it'll do uh, field of view, depth of view table, hyperfocal table. But we're not worried about any of that. We're only going to deal with the moon. So we're going to go up here to the upper left-hand side where my finger is, where it says planner, and we're going to click on planner. Now, I'm going to explain a little bit. We're going to work with this part to begin with. Down here at the bottom, this is a timeline. This, if we take and double click on this, it'll take us to the time that it is right now. Now, I'll explain this here. It opened up actually to the park where I'm going to set up to do the planning, but just to tell you what everything is. Now, this little blue line that you see right here, this light blue, this is for this date, this is the direction that the moon would rise over the horizon. The black line over here, the solid black line, the big one, that is the direction that the moon will set. Now, I'm going to slide the time back and forth so you can see the little one move. As the day goes by, that, will, that little light line will always point to the moon, at least in the direction. If we want to see where it is in the sky, take my finger, we go over here and look at this little section of the, of the uh, program right here and look for moon. Well, let's go to the present time. At the present time, it says the moon is at 300.7 degrees. So you could take your compass, set it to 300 degrees, and find where the moon is at this time. And it's only two point, well, I accidentally hit it down here. It's only 2.32 degrees above the horizon. But if we go back earlier in the day, say we go back to 
12 a.m. at noon, why, then it's 186 degrees and it's 76 degrees up in the sky. So this can allow you just to find the moon if you want to. But right now, let's take and show you how to move this. If I want to move this pen, let's say I go back, I'm going to hit this here. This is the home key. This takes me to where I am right now. And if I zoom in here, you're going to see this is my house right here. And this is this indicator pen. If I want to move that somewhere, all I have to do is scroll where I want to go. Now I'm going to zoom back out a little bit and I'm going to go down and look for the river because that is where here's the river. And if I zoom in somewhere in here is going to be here it is. Here's this little park right here. And if we keep zooming in, we can see the power lines and I'm going to want to have the moon come up in the middle of these these uh, towers to the power lines. I want it to be there and I want it to be a certain degrees above the horizon. And this is the plan that will tell you when you have to be there for that to happen. So let's find a place to set up our camera. So I'm just going back here. I want to get back as far as I can so the moon is relatively big in relation. Well, here's a trail. You can see this little trail going back in here. That's the little grass trail. So let's zoom in a little bit. We want to get right between these power lines. So all I have to do to get that indicator pin there is to take my finger and hold it for a second. And it jumps in. So there it is. And again, we'll double click that to get it to the correct time. The moon's almost always set. Now we want to, this is how we figure out when we have to be there to where the moon will be centered between those towers and a certain degrees off the horizon. So what we do, if you follow my finger, we'll go down here to where it says find. It's in the lower left hand corner. We click on that. Now I'll explain this a little bit. What this black means is that from where we set up our camera, the moon will never ever be where it's black. Well, we're going to shoot this way, so there, it means that the moon will be there at some time. We just maybe never know too, or at what time. So we look over here in the upper left. You can, you can figure for the sun at azimuth, the sun at azimuth and elevation, the moon at azimuth, and the moon at azimuth and elevation. Now, what that means. If we were to just shoot moon at azimuth and we were to give it a direction, it would show when the moon would be centered between the towers, but it could be at any elevation. We're not designating an elevation, so it will show where the moon will be between those towers. But sometime the moon might be not full, it might be on the horizon, the next time it might be 30, 40 degrees in the sky. But we want it to be centered between those towers. So we do want to enter an elevation. So what we'll do is we'll click right here with my finger where it says moon and azimuth and elevation. We'll click on that. Now, all that has done is telling me that I can change if I want. I've got to set the direction. Right now, you can see this little blue pen. It's aimed to the south rather than between the uh, tower. So we want to change that figure. So what I'll do is I'll zoom out a little. I'll hold my finger at the bottom of the blue pin till it pops in the air. Then I'll just take and move it. I'll go there. Let's, let's go a little bit further. Zoom out a little bit more just to make sure. Pop that baby up. Take her down. Oh, maybe somewhere in here. Now that's still, that's 124 degrees. It's right between those towers. And see that now that where we move that pin has reflected up here in the azimuth. So we have that set right. Now we want to determine, we want to tell the program how high off the, um, uh, how much of an elevation we want off the horizon. Well, I already have it here with eight degrees, but I'll click on it anyway. So you would go up here, and if this wasn't eight degrees, if this was something else, you would click on it. Now, what this indicates, where this little indicator is bright, that means that the moon could be at any one of these elevations. Now, watch the ele as I change, it goes up. So, at some time in the future, the moon could be 64 degrees, anything in there. But we want it to be 8. Well, it's hard to move your finger here and get it exactly at 8. So, what you do is you go down here where it says numeric, 1, 2, 3. Click that. Now what that does is going to allow me to enter in 8 degrees here in elevation. So I clear out what's there. I enter 8 and then I just click off of it. 
Now see, it's reflected. Now, in this direction, we're searching at this elevation, plus or minus two degrees, that because it's going to be hard to get it exactly eight degrees, but it might be seven and it might be nine, or plus or minus two degrees. Now we want to give it a date range. We don't want to, if we want to search, we don't want to wait for three years for it to sit there. So we're going to give it a date range. So we can click on the date range right here. Now, it's easy enough if we want, we can go down here and say, okay, let's make it in a three month period. If we wanted to do custom, we could click on here and pick a date. Like for instance, the starting date 7-8. Well, we don't want that date. It's only one day. Uh, so we could click on that and then we could make our own. So let's go 1 August, September 8 and click done. So now it's 7 8 21 to 9 8 21 between that period. Okay, now we are all done. We've got the azimuth entered, we've got the elevation that we want, and we've got the date span. So now all we got to do is search. Well, up here, see this little icon up here in the upper right hand corner, right there where my finger is, click on it. Now, it's done its searching for us. And if we look over here where it says phase, if it's blue, that means it's daytime. If it's black, that means it's nighttime. If it's red, that means it's the golden hour, right after sundown. Now this is a good time. These two bottom ones are really good times to take shots because there's still enough light to light up your foreground. And you might even be able to get the foreground and the moon in the same shot without having to do any blending. And I just like these two. But right now, here it says there is a full moon at night. If we look over here, it gives us the date. It's going to be 724, which is a Saturday. At 10.08 p.m., the moon will be exactly where we tell it. It will be 124 degrees. It'll be about approximately 8. Now remember, this is approximately. This is 7.45 because it's plus or minus 2. But this is, this is pretty good. So we know if we are there, we go there at night, we set up our camera, we line between the two towers and we want to raise our cameras to where about eight degrees it'll be there at 10 08 p.m okay so that's how we find now we could let's see just for a sake of a friend of mine that wants to um, uh, maybe want to do this let's cancel this one out uh, let's go ahead back to my house and then let's try and zoom out. And I'm going to try and find the city of Kirkwood train station right here. Now, there's a strange. Now, say we want to try and get the moon right over the top of that spire. Uh, and let's just say uh, that we have estimated that it's going to be about, oh, maybe three degrees above the horizon will be just above this spire. Now let's find a place to take our shot. So we'll go back because we know the moon is going to be over here in the east. So we'll go back. Well, here's the bridge. So we'll, we'll, we'll get here on the bridge and we'll put our camera right on the walkway of the bridge and shoot between the rails. So I'll hold my finger there. Yeah, let's do it over here. I'll hold my finger there. There it is. Now it's in there. Now, <laughs> Now let's take and go back over here where we can see. Let's go to the, go down here to where it says fine. And now we got it because I just did it. We're going to have to <laughs> bring this back because it's still way down there in Hoboken somewhere. There we go. All right. I'm, I'm making a mess out of this right now, but we'll get to it. We will get to it. We will get to it. Okay, so let's pop this up. Bring it over here so we can see better. Keep zooming in. We'll find our railroad tracks again, wherever they disappear they are. Bring that up. Bring that over on approximately there. Let's zoom in. So, gosh darn it. We'll zoom in so we can get the train station. 
we can see the train station anyway, which is right there. Raise that pin up and put it right over the top of that spar. Okay, so now we know. We know what our azimuth is, our target azimuth is going to be. And we want to have the moon azimuth and elevation. Now we said we want, now we can see it's just barely in the, in the, in here. So it's not going to have as many options as the other one had. So let's get our elevation. We'll click there. Uh, we'll do it in numeric. And what do we say? I think we said we wanted uh, uh, 2.5 or 3.5. Now nah, that'll do good enough. And we'll go. Okay, and we'll just click over here somewhere to set that 3.5. We'll use the same dates, and we want to have this elevation. As we can see, it'll fit. We've got it there. So let's go ahead and go up here and do our search. Okay, good. Now, we don't have any good options. Now, if you don't see a moon at all, like right here, that means it's a new moon. <laughs> so we don't have a lot of good options at 3.5 degrees, but we do have some moons and we could pick this date and get a, what is that, almost a, a two-thirds moon and we could get it on 827. Now, if we weren't too particular about how high it is over the spire, we could go up here and just go moon at azimuth rather than with elevation. Now we can go ahead and tell it to search. Now you're going to have a lot more options. Here they are. But each one is going to be higher degrees. Like this is 6 degrees. This one's going to be 27, whatever. So you can go down here and see if you can find a, a good one. Well, we're, we still don't have many good options. But it looks like this 827 with 3 quarters moon from where we set up. That is the shot we could get anyway. Well, anyway. That shows you how to use photo pills to make, find a location and to get a date and a time.